welcome Nugents and welcome community members to the Zonia Academy lectures. Uh, for those of you who have not been to our lectures before, the background on our lectures is our community founders back in 1863, the Benzonia Academy was created by our founders. And it was going to be a Northern Michigan educational mecca uh, for people to have received a liberal education, regardless of race or sex. And so we seek to carry on that tradition by having these lectures the second Thursday of every month. During the winter, we switch over to a four o'clock schedule. And uh, we're always going to be the next few months uh, till April at the Mills Community House. So welcome. Our upcoming lectures next month, we have Elmer Bissler. If you've never been to the Elmira Area Historical Museum in Lake Ann, I encourage you to. It's like a mini Greenfield village. And Elmer will be here. He's working with their founder, Vera Carmi, on a program about uh, early, late Ann and Elmira days. And then in December, we have a wartime Christmas. And our former board president, Brian McCall, will be presenting about 1944 Christmas time. And next Tuesday, we hope you'll join us online. We're collaborating with the Library of Michigan, the Leelanau County Historic Preservation Society, and the Leelanau Historical Society. And we're offering a virtual program on Michigan's county poor farms. And so if you go on our website, you can learn about that. And now I'm going to welcome our curator, Jane Perkis. Um, she is going to talk, with this being an agriculture um, she is seeking some support from our local farmers. Hi, everybody. Um, the Historical Society has been collecting farm implements um, for 52 years. Uh, that's how long we've been in existence. And a lot of the stuff I have no clue what it is. <laughs> I have really no clue. Yeah, and so I'm hoping that some of the farmers in the audience um, might be able to come over to the museum and help me. And from one to three, so if you come and and you know, if you make something up, I don't know the difference. So. <laughs> um, we are, you know, about 20 years ago, we built a pavilion um, down the alley below the museum, and it just has not been successful in, in, its, in the current form. And so we've enclosed it to sort of like a barn, and so it'll have a lot of farm equipment and um, that kind of stuff in it. And also at the Drake School, our one-room school that's in Platte Township, there's a shed behind the school, and every child that went to that school lived on a farm either as farm labor or farm owners. And we're putting some subsistence farming, a lot to do with um, dairy into that shed. And um, the building is being rebuilt as we speak. I bet Brendan's painting right now. So anyway, if um, please come and visit us. The new exhibits, the new agricultural exhibits will be open next summer. And if anybody can come and help tell me what some of this stuff is. Um, Saturday afternoon from one to three. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. And our museum is still open during the winter, uh, Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 11 to 4, so we invite you to join us. Um, I also want to remind you that we have launched a new book, Thompsonville in Time. The order, one of the orders has arrived at the post office and will be at the museum tomorrow. So we are accepting orders. The hardcovers will be in by the end of the month and can go online and order. But the reason we're here tonight is to hear from our new uh, farm friends. And uh, we started speaking with Duane about this program about a year and a half ago. And what I asked them to do basically is share their experience growing up on a farm. Um, we sometimes, I'm one of the people who romanticized farms when I was growing up. I thought my farm friends were lucky. And then as I grew older, I realized that they worked really hard and had pretty tough lives. Um, but mixed in with a lot of joy, um, challenges. And so the, the Nugent brothers are going to speak with you from the heart about their experiences. There could be some good natured ribbing along the way, um, but I hope you enjoy their presentation. I'll give you a little brief summary. Each of the men has accomplished so much in their personal life. So I'll just give you a brief overview. Um, what has caught me the most about their bios is that they were two of the three I know were born at Ann Markham Hospital. 
if you don't know, it was the predecessor to Paul Oliver. And Duane was the second baby born there. Um, Duane is a um, chemical engineer. He graduated, like many people in his family, from Michigan State. And then he went on to earn his master's in chemical engineering from U of M. For many years, he lived in Ohio and he worked on a number of projects. Um, in 1989, he started consulting with his brother John at Graceland Fruit, where he designed the equipment for drying and slicing fruits and vegetables. Uh, the closest Duane says he ever came to actually farming was when he embedded a tree paint and a, a sprayer to apply it. And he notes the paint specifically for cherry trees worked exceptionally well, in fact, so well that only one application was needed, making it not great for repeat sales. <laughs> um, and since moving back to Frankfurt, Duane has been an active volunteer throughout the community, most recently serving on the Historical mm -hmm. Society Board um, and the Mrs. Presence and the SS Milwaukee. Now, Neil, many of you, when he speaks, if you don't know him yet, you might recognize his baritone. He's one of the uh, local well-known uh, barbershoppers. And he also owned, uh, along with his wife, Linda, New Chinese Hardware for over 31 or 35 years. He's been in a variety of church choirs. And like his brothers, he's been active in the community as well. And he realizes now that growing up on the farm was to get beyond measure. And brother Jim works at the MSU. Uh, just, just, he was a district horticulturalist at the Horticulture Research Station um, over in Lake County. And he was quite known in the fruit world himself. In fact, Cornell University named a cherry for him. And what's the name of the cherry? Nugent. Just the Nugent cherry, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that it was a new cartoon. And then um, his wife, he credits his wife, uh, Tati, with running their farm while he was a horticulturalist. And then when uh, he retired, he took over the farm um, from Tati so she could move on to another career. So it's my uh, pleasure to welcome the Nugents. Okay, good, thanks. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, um, I just wanted to first introduce our family. This picture was taken at our parents' 25th wedding anniversary, but that's the, the uh, family. Uh, Dwayne is on the left. He's the oldest, and brother Don, brother Neil. They thought they had their family uh, seven years after Neil. I came along as an afterthought. And they were for sure done until six years later when the twins arrived. So I'm doing it. <laughs> I was like, it's a shock. Um, but anyway, um, just a quick background to kind of put in perspective um, our uh, a little bit further back in history. But in, my grandfather, Nugent, my dad's father, Wesley, was born in 1861 in Canada emigrated into the United States, probably through the Sioux, because he ended up in, uh, uh, working in a logging mill up in uh, Newberry, where he met Mary Burns, who would become my grandmother. She was the cook um, in the logging camp. And um, so they started out their career up there. They, they moved down here. That was, they got married in the 1880s. Um, and the first couple of kids up there, but moved down to Benzie County to the Case Mill uh, in Case Road, uh, living on Homestead Road. <coughs> okay, I'm going to swing it around. <laughs> We're hoping to avoid swinging there, but that works. Um, they, uh, and from there, they bought 120 acres of pretty low country, uh, low ground on uh, Cook Road, wooded ground that they homesteaded. Um, by 1894, they had a uh, barn raising and a house raising where they built the log house and the log barn. And that's where um, they lived. Several more children were born until uh, 1904. Um, Jim Crawford was the county sheriff and owned a nice farm on Crawford Road. He died, unfortunately, with a uh, heart attack. Um, and grandma bought um, uh, the farm from Jim Crawford. So they moved um, 
the, the, down at the old place, they just, uh, that was pretty much just cattle ground. It wasn't good for fruit, but general farming uh, was the norm then. And they uh, would move to this farm. One interesting story is when they were in those early years in Benton County, um, in the winter after they had the farm, grandpa would take his team of horses and go up to the UP, Southern UP, to uh, work in the logging mill in the winter, logging camps. Um, you could get paid extra if you had a team of horses. And late in the winter, though, if you needed to get back across the straits, well, there's still ice to get across uh, the straits. But the, the mill owner would pay, or the loggers would pay a bonus. It's sailor. And one year, Grandpa kind of stretched that. He got back to the straits. He's coming across with a team of horses, and there's open water. And he, so he has to walk down until the ice finally comes together on this fissure that got close enough that the team would get over it and came back down. Um, I can't imagine me doing that, but Grandpa uh, <laughs> did. So this is a family who ended up there was, um, Grandma gave birth at 18, but 13 lived through infancy, 10 boys and three girls. And eight of those 10 boys settled in Benzie, or, or Manistee counties. So that's kind of why the Nugent name is so common when you have that many boys. Um, uh, four of those boys went into World War I and were able to return. So very fortunate on that. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's Dad's side of the, of the outfit. And I, on my mother's side, her name was Macy Cornell and her father was on a farm on Joyfield Road. Uh, uh, property just east of uh, one of the Putney farms uh, in uh, was the Cornell place. It wasn't a very successful farm, and, and Grandpa moved from there when Mom was small uh, into into Alberta or Frankfurt, right on 22 there by the bridge, uh, and, and a nice nice house there. And that's where Mom, uh, uh, her brother, was born, and where she grew up. This yes, was taken uh, not late. Well, my my uncle, her brother, was a uh, was a navy pilot, and but uh, he had just finished his uh, his training at Corpus Christi when the war ended. So thankfully, he never he never went to war, but he still had the rank. And I remember when when uh, I was a kid. Uh, of course, I was born in forty three, so I was just a kid when he came home, but. Uh, who had, I remember him in his uniform. Pretty darn impressive. Anyway, they married in 19. Uh, well, I should. You mentioned the the, the uh, great school about about four miles away from there is uh, a, a school that was near Otter Creek, and my mother was uh, was the teacher at that one room school at the time that uh, the dad started courting her and managed to uh, talk her out of a budding career in, in teaching at the uh, company of farm life. 1936 is when they got married. Uh, oh no. Yes, 37 they were married. 36, dad and my uncle Dave uh, bought the farm from my grandfather who moved to Alberta. And, and uh, they bought the farm and uh, uh, in 1937, dad got married. Now uncle Dave was already married and had a baby, Ronald Nugent, who just passed away just a few weeks ago, and uh, but uh, so so now there was there was Dutton and Macy and Dave and and uh, Esther and little Ronnie, and it was kind of crowded in the farmhouse. Although Dad and Mom were upstairs and they were downstairs, but anyway, and, and the year later they decided Uncle Dave decided to sell his. His share of the farm to dad, and so so that that's when mom dad started their family. Then in forty nine, uh, thirty nine, uh, Dwayne came along. No, thirty eight, thirty eight. Dwayne came along. <laughs> forty one. Don came along, and then and I was there. And like Jim said, they figured that was that. I mean, we had three perfect boys. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, uh, Let's see. Uh, okay. Yo, Jim, you're next. Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, the problem, I think, was probably that there was, well, there was upstairs, downstairs, there's only one kitchen. <laughs> so probably yeah, that one. And, uh, <laughs> anyways, um, life on the um, farm, uh, when I was growing up, we were just in that transition. We were, we were using uh, tractors. So the last team of horses that Dad had were a team called uh, Queenie and Bessie. Queenie and Bess, um, uh, and that uh, was a nice old cutter that we used to enjoy taking out for rides. Um, the, uh, but one thing about the general farming that was common then, Every farm had its had livestock and raised crops with livestock. And then usually there was a cash crop, often something like potatoes, maybe, um, um, and fruit, of course, was coming along. Uh, but the, you, you, every farmer couldn't afford to own all of their own equipment. So a lot of farmers could share equipment, but they also had to share labor. Because when it came time for harvesting corn or um, uh, grains, it, it, it took um, a team of people. So this was very common. This was taken before my time. Here they're cutting corn by hand. We had a corn grinder that used a big steel wheel as a drive that was built for pulling with a horse or before tractors had PTO. So that would provide the top power. They would cut the corn and put it in bundles. Then we'd pick up those bundles and put it on the, on the wagon that was going into the silo. Because the silage corn has to be kind of moist. And this is the silo filler. We use that very same uh, type of silo filler. Maybe it was this very, probably the same one um, when when uh, we were growing up. Though we would have been come in in bundles. And the corn that wasn't going in the silo then would get shocked, and that would get, allow the corn to dry. Um, we had dad had um, milk cows early, sold cream to rice and dairy. By the time I was along. But the beef cattle was always, I think, uh, the time that came along, it was just either down to one, you always kept one milking cow just so we'd have milking cream and butter. And when it came right down to it, we, we produced a lot of the food that we ate. Um, and this was just blocking up milking that cow. We always had chickens too, along with a, you know, a couple of pigs that we fat out for our own use. And, um, but the chickens were, this was actually a picture with Dwayne when he was just a little tot. He mixed in with those chickens, only two or three. That was always the first job he did. And actually there was a time when mom and dad didn't have uh, chickens when I was younger. We got out of the beef cattle business, and got rid of the chickens. Then the twins came along and they were getting old enough that mom decided they needed a job. So she got back into the chicken business <laughs> just to make sure they had some work to do. Okay. So among the livestock, we also had dogs and, dogs and cats. We would, we seemed like we always had one herding dog. And uh, I counted as many as 30 cats in the barn one time. So the cats kept the mice down and the granary in the barn, and the dog helped herd the, the uh, cattle. One of, the, one of the, the first dog that I remember is old Dick, and he was, he was, uh, I guess he wanted to be famous. Because he liked to have his picture taken. If he saw somebody out with a camera, he would get in pose in front with his paws up. And uh, so this uh, in the spring, my dad sheared Dick because of his long hair. And after he'd been sheared, he did not like his picture taken. <laughs> he would run and hide if he saw him in the camera. So, had another dog with, that was a uh, husky, and he was had a peculiar had, had a, He loved snow. And so in the wintertime, he would sleep out in the snowdrift rather than in the barn. 
You said just the way they're bred. You should tell the story about the about the cat with the with the silage. Well, yeah, it was we were milking cows one evening, and uh, one of the cats looked awful sickly. He looked kind of mangy, in fact. And uh, you notice that she was over by the, where the juice was running out of the silo and uh, eating the juice, drinking from the silo. Of course, that's fermented. <laughs> and, uh, so my dad said, son, that should be a lesson. This is what happens with alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Um the the um <laughs> we put this picture in because I uh, thought you might find it interesting. This is out at what we called the old place, which was that original 120 acre homestead. Um, we can take that would, would later buy that. Dad and mom bought that farm from Grandpa uh, later in the, uh, than they bought the um, first farm. But, anyways, the one the old long barn is still standing, but the building behind it, the, the shed, that was an old horse uh, stable at the Blaine Church. And then and by about 19, after, about after World War II, we're not exactly sure, Blaine bought about 1946. The, there were, people are no longer driving the horse and buggies to the church, right? And so they didn't have any more use for the horse table at the church. So um, they had some other uh, um, men probably uh, moved that horse shed down to our old place. We continued to use it for equipment storage for many years. Um, <clears throat> On our farm, we had um, the, the very typical of this area. We had uh, the um, beef cattle I mentioned, and, but our main cash crops were fruit. And um, we grew, you know, tart cherries, sweet cherries. Um, those were our main crops, but also apples, peaches, plums, pears. Um, even had one area where there was a, they, they had an old grape plant just for their own use, not for sale, for sale but a old pear tree growing up next to it. And by the time I was a kid, the trellis was long gone on that grapevine. And the grapevines had crawled up, climbed up this pear tree. And I thought as a kid, grapes grew on trees. And <laughs> you could get a 16 foot ladder out and harvest these grapes. Um, I could reach the top of them. So yeah, I'm quite a horticulturalist in, in the making here. <laughs> but um, we would, we sold our, our, our fruit to various processors in the area, some fresh fruit. Um, uh, in, the, in the 1960s, we got into strawberries, and it was really when we got fairly large in strawberries that they decided to get rid of the cattle because first cutting hay came off about the same time as strawberry harvest. But um, with the strawberries, and this is actually a picture of cross protecting strawberries, that, that was on a farm down on, on uh, it's a Livingston place down on the corner of Six Mile and Swamp Road. Um, <clears throat> so again, fairly cold area, so we had to have your protection or um, cross protection. But with the with the cherries and the strawberries, all those were hand harvested, right? So back in the day, we didn't have the mechanical harvesting, so it required a lot of migrants. And our farm, maybe for the cherries, we might have uh, twenty five. 30 uh, maybe migrants. But when we added the strawberries, it took a lot more than that. Now we're talking way over 100 migrants, um, and I believe over 150 migrants. So we had um, uh, we had some housing, but we also <coughs> um, utilized uh, other farmers with their housing because they, um, the Migrants would come in and this came an early job before cherries would come on. So they would come work on the farm. Um, and actually the, the uh, migrant house that we had um, was dad put in, kind of upgraded the housing in the fifties. Now I'll turn it over to Dwayne because he was involved in that project, the new migrant house. 
you know, I took a mechanical engineering course or drafting course in high school. And so I drew up the plans for uh, motile, 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 uh, motel. Uh, we put big doors on it so it could be used for equipment storage in the wintertime when the lions weren't there. Then uh, we, we drove it out of poplar and in the winter cut the poplar, took the logs to the mill and had them milled and the lumber used to build the hotel. It was, I, I enjoyed the uh, sawmill because the all of who were owned it was, did not have the manpower to run everything. So if you're going to have some wood, that you had to supply a man. And I, I particularly enjoyed that job. Okay. You know, we all really enjoyed that job on uh, going down into that water part with sawmill and seeing the wood cog gears that ran up in, in, the, in the wheel and the belts. That's, that was a, a treat and a half that we all looked forward to. And the whole building would shake when that baby was running. <laughs> <laughs> you would feel a vibration everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with the migrants came a lot of friendships, many of them lifelong. Some of our migrants ended up staying in the area. Um, uh, Nona Dial was 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 the Dial family. They came up every year. She married that region, um, and they lived here um, their lives. So it, it was just a, a lot of fun. Um, towards the towards the end of you, um, our team, our migrants were um, white families from the south. But one of the families. Uh, that came up had to start driving two cars because they had two speedboats that they had to pull up. They couldn't pull up behind one car. And after, when we'd be, uh, I didn't have to haul in the last load of cherries um, and to get dad or my older brothers to do it. They would uh, help me sometimes pick up the last uh, lugs of cherries so they could, so I could go down with a water skiing on the very light. We didn't have a boat for water skiing. <laughs> so it was, it was, but some, Lifelong friends, but with that, um, that kind of came to an end in the, in the late sixties as we transitioned into mechanical harvesting, and that was a huge shift um, for the farm. One of the things that we had to do mechanic for mechanical harvesting was to pool the cherries. We still do. We use cooling pads. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Today we power them with, with good wells. We have nice cold water. But back in the day, our well was way too small and some of the other farms were. And we actually went back to cutting ice on Upper Herring Lake and putting it into uh, the barn for storage, covering it with sawdust. Um, I remember one year getting it prepped for the next year and digging out and there's still ice ice left from the year before um, that, it, that we hadn't used. But we would put this in a tank, recycle water through it to cool them. Now, we only did that for maybe three years or so, but it was, it was kind of an interesting process. Um, and of course, that had been done for years and years and years way back when they used ice to put in ice houses um, before the days of refrigeration. Um, upper Herring Lake, we have seen this. You wouldn't have seen the tractors out there with the ice out, but um, uh, it would have been very similar. All right. Yeah. I'm doing Okay. Uh, but as it became more and more mechanized, we had lots of lots of equipment, but not always farmers and equipment and, and uh, stuff breaking and so on. And so that the winter time when we weren't raising crops was spent in the shop, uh, rebuilding, bearing down engines and completely rebuilding the bearings and the, everything that needed to be replaced in the engines in the sprayers and tractors and, and uh, all the equipment. And uh, dad was very, uh, he was very specific about that. He wanted, didn't want to, uh, uh, he always was careful to take care of that. And I don't remember a single major breakdown during any harvest season. He was always prepared. 
and and uh, and with the equipment in, in, in good repair. Uh, we also had this my project. No, I'm going to talk later on that. Oh, I didn't. It's mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was also a very inventive guy, and and uh, and he invented. Buzzery that would go on to the three point hitch of a tractor so you could drive around with it without trailing it. Uh, in the early days, he invented a buzzery uh, drag saw first and then converted it to a buzzery that would run by the uh, engine of Grandpa's first car, 1914 Model T. And, and Dad designed and built a fly ball governor for that, for that uh, motor so that, so that when it was not under load, it would be idling. And as soon as it started feeling a load, just like you would press down on your accelerator, this would accelerate and, and uh, carry the, the saw through the log and then relax the speed of the engine. It was a pretty nifty little uh, gadget that he made. But he designed and built a, uh, a large rake that was used to, to uh, in the winter we also Pruned, uh, that was the time to prune the, the trees and, the, and the, the, the cuttings would be raked out into the middle of the row. And that designed a big rake that was about eight feet wide with long tongs that were about eight or 10 feet long and, and uh, all built out of wood, by the way. And, and we liked to work with wood, all hardwood. And, and uh, this was on the, on the, the tractor. Yeah. Anyway, it was uh, he 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 was very inventive, and he was a problem solver. But uh, we that was all part of uh, part of living there. I had a uh, <coughs> kid that lived not a what? Oh, I didn't add it myself. You're into that. Go ahead and finish Yeah, that's a good one. Well, <laughs> the, uh, well the, the mower broke this after dad because the folks bought a, a lawn, lawn mower. Of course, it was a real type with a that had a gasoline engine on it and was self propelled. So I used it out of the, the lawn, but I modified it a little bit. I, <laughs> I took our wagon and attached the wagon to the mower so I could stand up in the wagon and uh, it just pulled me around the yard. <laughs> <laughs> And then that, that brings me to Oli. He's the same age I am. And uh, he, he was getting uh, some of the darndest things up there. He didn't have a mother. So he got, I don't know where he got to come up with stuff. One day he came over to our house driving an old car. He wasn't old enough to drive, but uh, he, he, had, he was towing behind the car, this coaster. It was just a plank, wooden plank with four wheel, uh, wheels on it. And uh, anyway, he, he got a hold of these wheels and it was really good coaster bearings and uh, wanted to go down to Mick Road where the, there's a hill and try it out. So I, I asked the car when we headed down there. When Dad saw us pulling out the, out the driveway and headed down the road with this coaster all along behind the car. On a rope. So, uh, Dad made it down there 
before we, we left, he wouldn't let me write on it. He said that only could write it. And so the deal was only write it first. And if it went, if it worked all right, then uh, I could write it. Well, the, the wheels were so darn good. He, he took off because he's laying down on it. And uh, it was a it was a little temperamental to, to steer, but uh, we followed Oli in, in the car and <laughs> Dad was up to fifty miles an hour. <laughs> and we, we we coasted down Lake Road almost to the. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. <laughs> and uh, when when all we got off of the poster, his face was white and cheap. <laughs> and he, he, he was done with that. <laughs> he wanted to leave it right there in that ditch. <laughs> so. Was that the same car that only changed into a into a convertible? No, that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> he wanted a convertible, all he had was an old sedan. But and he didn't have a saw, but he had an X. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of old stories. <laughs> Oh, I have met. She was she was the glue that held everything together, and and was the organizer. And uh, all the natural things mothers do, raising boys. She was also the accountant for the uh, for the family for the farm. And uh, there's a we have. Uh, saved a farm account book from 1939 that, and, and to give me some sense of the detail of how she, she kept track of everything in there on September 17, 1939 was 30 cents for a haircut for dad. <laughs> so actually to the penny, she kept track of everything, every bushel of peaches or pears or whatever they sold uh, is, is accounted for. And, uh, she was a, a stickler for that sort of thing. She also was a pretty good piano player, and uh, and so part of the, the singing that we did. Uh, one of the things that I remember about mom, she was she had her special recipes to do things. But one of the things she liked to make was crab apple pickle. It was like a sweet pickle relish, uh, a sweet pickle, uh, whatever you call it, liquid. And and uh, uh, but made with crab apples, so small, bright red crab apples. And uh, Dad wanted to was taking out a bunch of old apple trees that were in this block of apples. And on the corner of this was two crab apples and one wealthy tree. Well, Mom liked wealthies for her applesauce. So Dad was out there working, and she went out to the orchard, and she said. You aren't going to touch these trees, are you? And he said, well, yeah, we're going to have a nice, even all new trees. It's going to be a beautiful orchard, she said, except for these trees, right? <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't let him cut down. For this I, I got in and up. Um, in 1950, Mom was helping Dad plant an orchard. Dad liked to have the trees really straight both directions, and she had planted one, and it was off a few inches. And he dug it up and, and uh, replanted it. So mom was seven months pregnant with me when she thought doing this. And she she said, Chester, if you're that exact, that's the last tree I'm planting. And she stuck with it. She doesn't plant it. Well, in, in 1950, uh, now we had we had three boys, and here I was born, uh, an unfortunate girl, a, a, not an immediate neighbor, but someone referred to us, and it turned 
which her family had kicked her out at age 13. And, uh, and uh, we took her in. I should say my parents took her in. And so Millie lived with us and uh, all through school and through nurses training. And uh, she became a nurse and was, was at Paul Oliver for many, many years. And, and, uh, and so she was a part of the family. Uh, she, she was there until 1951, and Jim having been born in 1950. So she stuck around to, to help Jim, uh, help mom with that, with that new baby. Uh, let's see. You, you guys, hmm? yeah, I'm going to do that. That's next. I hear you. Uh, uh, <laughs> education was really important to, to my parents, my mother. It was just an innate teacher, and and uh, they when Dwayne was born, they started the college fund for however many kids they had. So that's the college fund kept building until until uh, 1956, June of uh, 1956. There was a hailstorm, a terrible hailstorm, and and uh, and I know it would have been 55. I think the, 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 the twins were. 56, 55. And anyway, they harvested no crops that year. Every every fruit, they hadn't started picking anything yet, and it was all damaged with that. We had we had an inch of ice in the in the front hall. Uh, Jim looked out the window. We're standing at the window looking out at this, and Jim looked out and he saw that he had a little little American flag on a little stalk, you know. And, was out there passing to a pool uh, down the walk, and and uh, she, he was upset and because he was going to it was going to get beat up. So Dwayne said, "I'll go get it." He picked up a wash tub and put it over his head and went dashing ten feet. <laughs> But uh, we wound up all, they stuck uh, to their guns and said, okay, all you kids have to go to college. You have to go. And there was never a question. We were not going to go. We were going to go. And Dwayne started in 56, by the way, the same year that the twins were born. And, and uh, he, for the next, the next uh, 22 years, we were, there was one of our family at Michigan State, at least one term, full-time student. Uh, with the exception of two years out of that, that 22. So it's the Michigan State owes us a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, Brother Don, when I'm very, very successful, he's the one who bought our farm, or bought in with that as a partner, and then later uh, uh, went on to, and he was a, he was a marketer for our excellence, and he went on to uh, develop Graceland Fruit as a fruit processing co-op and later developed the drying operations that you all know. And uh, and so uh, he he certainly put his education to work, as did all the rest of these guys except for me. <laughs> 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 he got into the hardware business and thought it was kind of fun. So I, <laughs> but uh, that was that that was the moment that I said I'm never going to be a farmer. Because I'm standing there, we're looking out, and I was 12 or 13, and, and, and uh, mom is holding dad, and they're crying. And, uh, and I just said to myself, I'm never going to do this. This is, I can't, you know, and, and uh, that, was, that, was just, uh, that was just the decision I made at that moment. You know, to know what I was going to do, but I knew I wasn't going to be a part of it. You want to inter interject your well, uh, in my senior year of high school, I was in FFA, and uh, I had three FFA projects. I had a field of corn, a heifer, and a pig that the FFA gave me to raise and breed with a, that I give back two pigs to the, to the club. So things, things didn't work out as well as I hoped. The uh, cattle got into the corn, 
Heifer when she had a calf, something went wrong, so she could never have a calf again. And the pig, although she came from a big litter, she only had four pigs and one of the rug. <laughs> and she laid on another one. <laughs> and I had to give the last two back to the bus. <laughs> So I decided engineering was a lot more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the slow learner up here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about me. But uh, you know, we had we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. There was there was a lot of work involved with this whole cedar bank, but but uh, one of the things that we we I think a unique thing, maybe not unique, but farmers don't get to take vacations, especially the ones that have uh, that have livestock. You got to know those cows every day. You got to feed, and and uh, a whole group of farmers in Benson, California, Blaine and Joyfield, uh, have gotten together and back in and the uh, I'm not sure when, uh, but anyway, they bought a, a large strip of uh, probably a quarter mile of. North Shore property of Herring Lake, Upper Herring Lake, and and uh, they each bought a lot, and and uh, and that was some built little cabins, some just tented down there, but or maybe it was just a place to go and swim and have picnics and so on. But it was a cooperative thing. They had a big bee every June, and and uh, clean things up and and uh, make it ready for the summertime. But that was that was one of our vacations. We, we didn't. Uh, uh, that was yeah. You'll see this association is still there, and it's still maybe fifty percent of it's still owned by farm families. Uh, our our big uh, big. Uh, Family that is dad's family all got together at Christmas time and had a big Christmas and and at the 50th anniversary of all of the uh, of our kid of uh, each of dad's brothers and sisters and dad's age we came on and it was the birthday 50th birthday and this is a victory we also had a at the uh, summer picnic at Evergreen or usually at Evergreen Shores or sometimes halfway. So he called halfway picnics down Flair, which is the, all the folks that were living downstate, the family would come up and, and eat with us. So there there would be those were big affairs. There would be uh, 60, 80, 100 people at those things. And then and then they, the big family had a get together every at the for a fifth birthday party for each of the dads. That was that I think is taken a couple. Howard's birthday. Uh, uh, okay, but uh, but uh, that's just the uh, the family as it has grown. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the, our, our Newton family, we would get together. That I think that might have been at a uh, at a Christmas at a Christmas party. We got together and we always sang and had fun and and uh, and, and Uncle Bill would come and uh, be the Santa Claus for us. And um, he was a very interesting man. <laughs> There's, there are stories to tell, but we won't. And, and uh, anyway, uh, uh, let's see. That, that was, uh, you know, we, we just had a lot of uh, fun things that we did. Uh, Mom, uh, there was a picture of, yeah. But, and on Sundays, we often go visiting. Uh, relatives, grandmas, uh, Cornells, and and uh, or uh, other aunts and uncles, and uh, we have dinners. And then at grandma and grandpa's, we always had a sing afterwards after Sunday dinner. Uh, they were singers, and I guess that's where I got my oh, uh, count down to ten minutes. She said, "Hold them up so the people can see." <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, that was. Uh, 
it was a great place. It was a great place to, to grow up. I think this is the car we owned when we took a, a, a big trip for us was going to Muskegon or the Detroit area or the, uh, uh, Manistee to visit relatives. And when one trip up to visit our relatives in Manistee, um, turns out we had, they had bought, mom had bought a new car and it was the same as the, the King Woods car. And they had just shot a, I don't know, well, they had something that they weren't supposed to have. <laughs> mom came, not when they knocked on the door, they could hear people in there, but nobody was coming to the door. They were madly trying to stuff the meat into the, into the freezer and get it out of the way. Anyways, um, they had, they had like to uh, make things. I, I had to kind of skip through some of the things got out of, out of the sorts. But he made jumpers. Um, a lot of you will remember in this area, it's a pretty unique setting tool for, to this area. It's, uh, we, almost didn't, we didn't know how unusual they were. But um, he made jumpers after retirement and then sold them at the hardware store. So far. Um, early on, people would make their own jumpers. But he, he liked to make other things to things for the kids, rocking horses, all kinds of things. Especially, yeah, especially when he got uh, kind of retiring from the farm. But we had lots of fun. Um, one thing that, uh, that I always enjoyed on the farm, this shows a sleigh, but it doesn't, it shows it with most of the deck off. This is actually a picture of playing in, in the meads going, going uh, over to the one room school. But they would, the, those slaves had a deck like a, like a hay wagon. We had three of them. And Dad would have <coughs> uh, groups for sleigh rides. It might be a 4-H group or a church youth group. Uh, and it wasn't just our church, it was others in the community. We had, um, we had three slaves. We, of course, would pull with a team of horses to begin with. But that, and then down the nuts. We pulled with it. It was always a lot of fun, but of course, you know, growing up, you're, you're doing things, sledding, skiing, fishing in the summer, all those things that kids do out in the country, and it's a, it's a pretty fun place to grow up. Um, I'm just, I'm just, we, we, just the way I was going to talk about, about family dinners. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> there were uh, farms. The, the, the farmhouse would put on big chicken dinners and uh, I, I don't remember eating uh, at a restaurant with our family, but I do remember eating at a, at a home. But they fix chicken dinners. People don't do that anymore. The uh, one room school was important. It was uh, on uh, Strikefield Road. Uh, I walked. Um, yeah. 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 Have to speed her up here. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, one, uh, walking to and from the school, I got to play along the way. Of course, I went there in kindergarten through third grade. And then these School was consolidated with the Zonia, and the rest of my school was done in Zonia. Yeah, I was going to say, I did the little trick I learned in the spring when the leaks were out. I ate, found that I ate leaks on the way to school. I smell so bad that the teacher had sent me home. <laughs> and I, was just, I just go back, play in the woods all day, go home and usual time. <laughs> 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 
they did it pretty well. No teachers got by our house. <laughs> got the mother to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell one quick story before we wrap up, but if my dad told he and Uncle Dave when they were growing up on the farm, um, down this, um, were it, had fun by picking up the chicken and kind of swinging it around and getting kisses and watching it staggered around. And one time they, they swung a little too much and the chicken flopped over and they're afraid it was dying and they would be in big trouble. So they went and got an air pump and you know, put it in, in the chicken's mouth and started to pump it up. Uh, it didn't fare so well. <laughs> Dad or Uncle Baby, uh, when, when their father found out what they killed the chicken. <laughs> well, we're supposed to wrap this up, but we'll be, we would be overjoyed to have you stay a little bit longer, ask any questions you would like to. I would like to say that, that you know this is the Nugents, and and but it's also the story of the Buckneys and the Lapwells and every other farm in the whole region. You know they all have these stories about growing up and everything, and and uh, so we're not so special, but we're just we're special in that you have uh, asked us to come and and, and, and that so many of you come and, and uh, listen to this. <laughs> well, thank you very much. What, what was the deal about an easy chair that everyone got presented with? Or, or what? Special birthday or that, was the, that was the 50th birthday present. Okay. Traditional, but when this generation got there, we won't let me take you. Well, I, I just have a comment. I'm a seltzer. First CJ was my dad. But what I remember is the Nugents were way more fun than smelters. <laughs> 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 we were all pretty envious of the fun that the Nugents had. Yeah. <laughs> we really wish we were part of that. <laughs> one, one summer, Neil was looking for plain heavens and he found enough pieces in the uh, parts laying around. He thought he might be able to make them out of labor. So he asked the plain if he could have that. And Wayne said, yeah, I'll give you a week's work, I think is what he paid. Three days. Yes, three days. <laughs> I got enough that there's a frame and a hood and an engine and it, it ran. And we, we had a ball of that. We called it the heat. Had no body, um, <laughs> but we sure had a lot of fun in the region. I have to say that I was putting that together the summer that I first started dating Linda. And so it, instead of going to the drive-in or someplace uninteresting, we went to the basement of Bug Evans Farm and, and uh, assembled this, this team, and I knew that was the right girl for me. <laughs> I don't know how many there. Oh, go ahead. Do we have a question? I, I remember an interesting story about the farmhouse getting electricity. Uh, go ahead, Jim. Do that. Wait, yeah. um, Grandpa was one of the First, put in electricity before rural electrification. There was no electricity out in farm country. So he put in electric generating. They built a, a shed under the house. We always called it the West Shed. But the equipment was gone by the time I grew up, but they powered electricity. But I will say that one day, I, one time, you know, late in dad's life, I asked him what was the most change he had seen. He grew up in, born in 1910, he saw a lot of change in technology. I said, what was the biggest change? And he said, electricity. And I said, I am surprised. I thought it would be tractors and transitioning from horses to, to tractors. He shook his head and said, no, electricity. Because with electricity, you didn't have to melt the cows by hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one question, speak about your dad, and, you know, his aging and uh, you know, what you could see well in his music. I just remember when you used to be part of that group down on Friday nights in Frankfurt. Yeah, yeah. That, that was when 
Ben was a fiddler, but he learned to taught himself to play back in the 30s, and he played for a lot of the country dances, the square dances. And uh, two of my uncles, his brothers, were callers. And uh, and Dorothy Rice, uh, we all know Dorothy Rice, or most of us do, was the piano player, and they they were active as a as a little uh, you know get togethers, barn dances and whatnot. But but uh, and Dad loved to play that too. But but he had injured his shoulder, and and you know, a young man, and finally when he got into his late seventies, uh, the bursitis got it so bad that he couldn't. He couldn't hold it, couldn't work it right. So he couldn't do the, so then he picked up a harmonica, which he'd never played before, and, and uh, joined up with a bunch of harmonica guys called the Harmonica Hobos. And they they were back in business, you know. And he, he just loved music. He, he, uh, as a matter of fact, if I may, when when he was milking the cows, but back when the hand milking days, and he would, he would be, milking this cow, and his favorite cow's name was Baby. And so you got to picture this, he's underneath the cow and he's milking the, and the, he's making temple with the squirts, you know, squirts, 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 squirts. Daisy, Daisy, we do. Daisy, 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 he, could, he was a good singer and could sing, but he never, I never heard him sing in a choir or anything like that. He just didn't do that. A little bit like Dwayne is. He can sing just fine, but he was just not doing that. <laughs> well, one thing for Dad is that he couldn't read a note of music. So it always, he always felt quite self-conscious when the band teacher would be there and he'd be playing the fiddle because he couldn't read music. So that's one reason. Yeah. Yeah. Mom could read music and sit down at the piano and play. And, so when we come home from church on Sunday, we do the same. Yeah. And uh, to, to uh, macular degeneration. And that, that took a lot of the fun out of his life. I mean, he lost it by his uh, early 90s. And, and uh, that, that made life tough for him. And uh, he had a, by that time, he built, he was in his uh, late 80s uh, when he, Build a greenhouse so he could get his garden started earlier and all this. And, and it got to the point very soon that he couldn't tell the difference between a weed and a and plant. And, and he just, uh, it took the fun out of it, plus all the woodworking, which he was always doing. Uh, it, it was out of the window. Out the window. So that was, it was a tough ending for Dad. But then, even into his 80s, was planting pine trees at the old place for reforestation. Um, which is just a classic farmer that's always looking ahead, um, knowing that he was never going to harvest those trees. A thousand every year. Wow. Yeah, by hand, one at a time. So, one to the man. Anything else? It's interesting. One of the things that the Bunge Schoolhouse kids did was the Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell us that, Dwayne. Yeah, uh, the. Uh, we used to, it wasn't uncommon at the country school to get a, a half day off or something. The kids would help somebody pick up potatoes or harvesting something else. But uh, one of the unusual was milk weed pods for the farm, uh, for the war effort. And uh, so he put them in gunny sacks and they were sent to a processing plant. I think it's somewhere north of us. But uh, that, that was interesting. What was that for then? Those were the, uh, they couldn't get the K pot for life jackets like and like this. And so they used milkweeds, you know, the, the fuzzy stuff. Wow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> are you aware of chivalry? The, the custom that was oh, yeah. it was a you know it was great fun for everybody except the married couple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
But it was it was a regular thing. You always did that. You don't you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, you'd make a lot of noise and wake up the newlyweds, and and uh, and they had to uh, you know invite you in, and then they had to uh, you know have some treats for you, cookies or cake or something nice, and then you could all go home. But if they had nothing to eat, well then you were just going to stick around. <laughs> There is one chivalry that was especially memorable to us. Linda and I and Jim was along uh, were when when Jim Bryan Jr. got married. And and he was uh, staying in uh, my aunt's cottage on the very late. And and we were all there was probably 25 of us, you know. And we were sneaking up. Mary, were you along on that? I, I'm Anne, but yes, I was not along, but I remember the smart. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we were sneaking up, and, the, and Carol is in the front, and he's carrying a, a new pump Carol shot case. gun. Or, hmm? Carol Case. Carol Case, yes. I did, and it was, uh, and Harold was leading the band here, and he had a pump shot gun, and I had an old muzzle loading musket behind. And we were going to kick it off with lots of noise. And then they had lots of bands and pots and horns and stuff. And they were trailing along behind us. So Carol is in front, and we're sneaking kind of up toward the cottage. And all of a sudden, he just dropped out of sight. <laughs> with a kind of a sploosh. So <laughs> found out that later that uh, that she'd been having they've been having trouble with the septic system. <laughs> The septic tank was open. <laughs> and Harold was standing in there about chest deep. <laughs> and he had a full beard and it was full. <laughs> <laughs> we woke them up laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but but as he had his own full, nobody would let him in, but he went out and took a bath. Oh, that, that was. That was very memorable. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, by the way, one of our notes. So we are going to keep this. Ask him about that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask him about that. But thank you so much, Nugent uh, Brothers, and for representing all the farm families and the contributions of agriculture um, to our communities and to many countries of our culture. But Thank you very much for joining us. I'll remind you that we are 501c3 nonprofit, so we rely on your donations, especially to support this lecture series. So if you haven't uh, <laughs> donated yet uh, for our lectures tonight, we appreciate that. Yeah, and we, we hope to see you next month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. <laughs>